we prepare to hear God's word, a reading from the Hebrew scripture, again, I invite you to a word of prayer. O God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Paul talked about these variety of gifts, and we discover a range of gifts in the story associated with Moses. This is a reading from Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. It's not a passage we normally hear. The lectionary doesn't include it, but it's an important part of the story of Moses. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people, and he saw their forced labor he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. Moses looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian, and he hid him in the sand. When Moses went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me? as you killed that Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid, and he thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came one day to draw water and to fill the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses, though, got up and came to their defense and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come back so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. The man said to his daughters, Where is he? Why did you leave the man? Invite him to break bread. So Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage, and she bore a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. After a long time, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned under their slavery, and they cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. And God heard their groaning. God remembered God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Long ago, Moses was a tired fugitive who finally stopped running and sat down beside a well. Now, in that day and age, things happened at wells because that's where people gathered. Everyone needed water, whether for themselves or for their gardens or for their livestock. A group of girls brought then their flock of sheep and goats to the well to be watered. But in that place, they were chased away by boys, shepherds, who believed their gender gave them privilege. And besides, how better to prove you're a man than bully someone else? Well, they were wrong, as such beliefs are always wrong. In that moment, Moses got up, and he made the shepherds wait their turn, and then he went further and helped the girls water their flock. And when they returned home, the girls told their father about this stranger, this Egyptian who had helped them. And immediately, he sent one of them back to find this man and to invite him to dinner as an act of gratitude and hospitality. Now, the story at that point speeds up quite a bit because within two verses, Moses has dinner, marries into the family, and becomes the father of a child named Gershom. But throughout it all, Moses remains an outcast, wandering in the wilderness. But through this act of generosity, he was able to become a son-in-law, a part of the family of the priest of Midian, a man who had seven daughters, one of which, Zipporah, became Moses' wife. 
My wife, Beth, is the fourth of five children. Her father is a retired Presbyterian minister who served a church in Milwaukee when I was pastoring in the nearby city of Racine, Wisconsin. When Beth and I started dating, I knew her father, and I knew her brother-in-law, who was also a Presbyterian minister in the area, and I'd had occasion to meet two of her sisters. But I'd never met Beth's mother, who was quite anxious to check out this bachelor who was courting her talented daughter. So one day, I was invited to the Johnstone house. And wouldn't you know it, on that day, by chance, all of Beth's siblings just happened to be there in the family room, waiting nonchalantly when I entered the house. For a brief moment, I wished I was the one huddling by a well somewhere in far-off Midian. But fairly soon, we were talking and laughing, and I was quickly welcomed lovingly into this new family. There's a cuteness in how I met my in-laws. There's a cuteness in how Moses settled into the family of Ruel in the land of Midian. But Moses' story also contains important themes of faith that we can't overlook. Themes like justice for the weak, welcome for the stranger, and forgiveness for the criminal. So start with justice. As we heard last week in the reading from Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh had instructed all the midwives that they were to kill the male Hebrew children. The midwives refused, though, as an act of faithfulness and justice. So Pharaoh went further. He demanded that now the male babies must be drowned and thrown into the waters of the Nile River. But his own daughter ends up vetoing that unjust law the moment she pulled Moses from the reeds. And then in today's passage, we discover Moses once more in a new land, but this time intervening. We're first told there was an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew. Later, he intervenes a second time when two Hebrews were fighting, and he insisted there must be peace between his own people. And eventually, he flees and he intervenes a third time, stepping in on behalf of the young girls who were being harassed by shepherds. On some level, we still have here a cute story, a stranger who protects young girls and ends up marrying into the priest's family. And we have an inspiring story, this young man of Egypt who's committed to protecting the weak and acting for justice for all. But the story is not a Hollywood drama. Moses is a migrant ending up in a foreign land. And Moses is a murderer, a felon fleeing punishment in his homeland. So how do we come to terms with the the messier parts of this cute story? Migrants and migration are very much topics of conversation right now. And it's a troubling, complicated subject, but there are parallels between what we hear and read about with Moses and what we're hearing about today. Moses lived in an Egyptian nation that oppressed the Hebrew people sorely. Moses fought back against that oppression. And in a moment, he killed an overseer. Did Moses make the best choice when he did that? From our modern perspective, no, he didn't. And I'll say more about that later. But in the end, Egypt was no longer a safe place for Moses, and he had to flee. So thank God for in-laws. Thank God that that time of rejection and persecution transitioned into a new chapter of domesticity and welcome and safety. Once again, Moses survived because of the intervention of others. And once more, it was people who were not explicitly part of the chosen people of God. See, God always paints on a canvas larger than any one race, one nation, or one people's history. Just over a year ago, in March 2019, Cyclone Idai struck the coast of Mozambique. Within the few short hours of one day, almost two million people needed help. 
A hundred thousand or more lost homes, a million acres of cropland were destroyed, and over one billion dollars worth of infrastructure was wiped out. It was the worst storm in Mozambique's history. And yet, as we all know, our world is facing a series of, quote, unprecedented storms that are becoming all too common today. The World Bank has estimated that three regions of the world, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia, will end up having more than 143 million refugees fleeing those regions over the next 30 years. Fleeing because of catastrophic weather events like the cyclones and droughts, or fleeing because of humanitarian crises that come as the byproduct of climate change and disasters. And that total of 143 million doesn't include the people who are fleeing persecution in their lands from dictatorships, from drug lords, from religious bigotry. Refugee crises are not going to go away, and neither of the American political parties has an answer immediately for this challenge. Now Moses and his adoptive family remind us that if we're going to have an important discussion about immigration, then we need to start from a place of compassion, of hospitality, of caring for the stranger as best we can as soon as she is here on our soil. For we are either all in this together, or we will soon see that none of us has a sustainable path forward at all. Now let's shift to the most challenging part of the Bible story, coming to terms with the fact that Moses committed murder. The Old Testament does not automatically condemn Moses for his act of violence. They stress that he struck down an oppressor and because of that action, it forced him to flee to Midian, and that prepared the way for his encounter with God at the burning bush, which eventually led to the freedom of all the Hebrew people from Egypt. Today, I don't think we can as easily condone Moses' act of violence. Thanks to the civil rights movement, to leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and John Lewis, we trust more in the power of nonviolent campaigns but the fact remains, Moses was a felon. He was guilty of murder, a fugitive seeking a new beginning in a foreign land. Even as people of faith, we find it hard to talk about forgiveness when it concerns people caught up in the tangled web of our criminal justice system. For far too long, we've been comfortable with racist rhetoric about law and order, three strikes and you're out, just lock them up. We've been slow, if not even indifferent, when it comes to forgiving and welcoming home citizens who've returned when their time behind bars is finally over. Felons in America have a wicked hard time finding housing or finding jobs once they're released, as they have to keep checking that box on every employment form acknowledging their criminal record, as they discover that they're no longer eligible for any sort of student loan assistance, as the doors of opportunity remain locked before them, even as they stand on the outside of prison bars. And let's expand this conversation to related issues. Right now, the largest mental health facilities in America are jails. They estimate from the National Alliance of Mental Illness between 25 and 40 percent of Americans struggling with illness are going to be spending time at some point behind bars or incarcerated. And add to that the issues around people struggling with drug addiction. It's been estimated that it takes on average eight years of on and off again treatments for people struggling with opioid and heroin addiction to gain just one year of sobriety. And so the question is, can we finally do what is right? Can we forgive and welcome back the returning citizen? Can we provide resources beyond prison for the mentally ill? Can we intervene and support families who are struggling with 
their own addictions or the addictions of loved ones who will relapse numerous times on the way to health. What does Moses' welcome into the home of a Midian stranger tell us about how we can treat the alien, the immigrant, the troubled soul waiting alone by the well, hoping that someone will offer them a pathway forward? The final verses in Exodus chapter 2 say that God looked upon the Israelites groaning under slavery and God heard their cries. God took notice of them. I think that's the first step in the journey of faith together, to notice. Moses acted for justice and set his people free, but he was only saved because he was noticed by strangers, by Pharaoh's daughter who plucked him out of the waters, by the Midianite priest who called him from the well to become part of his family. God used those acts of notice to then set in motion a new future for Israelites and Gentiles alike, for the Hebrew people of old, and for you and I even today. In the New Testament, a similar transition happened in the life of a man of violence who became the gospel proclaimer of the Prince of Peace when Saul became the Apostle Paul. And his witness to Christ's liberating grace was only possible because others could look at him and forgive him and welcome him and learn from him. So ask yourself, how many times have you been forgiven? How often has someone welcomed you in, has given you a second chance when you messed up, has opened doors for you so that you might succeed or be safe or be loved? Every marriage is the blending of two families. Becoming the body of Christ means blending lots of families, lots of stories. It means giving and receiving acts of compassion so that all might be welcomed, that all might know the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. Every week we say at some point the Lord's Prayer. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's not a contract where we promise to forgive only just as many times as we've been forgiven. Rather, it's a covenant. It's a call to a way of life and a sense of faithful humility that knows we're here and have been called to forgive others. And that's why it's right to do what we can for the stranger, for the migrant, for the returning citizen. That's why it's right for us to notice and to welcome the marginalized, the neglected, the lonely. God always paints on a canvas wider than just our story because God sees all. God hears, God notices, God cares for all. As children of God, as redeemed of Christ, may we go and do likewise. Amen.